everybody, and welcome back to our Sunday edition of Mailbag. I'll be your host today. My name is John Campia. Of course, as I mentioned on yesterday's Mailbag, we're for the next couple of weeks, we're going to try doing Mailbag a little bit differently. We're going to try to get through a whole bunch of more questions and all that kind of stuff. And I think... We set a record yesterday. I believe we covered 44 questions. I think the number was 44. 44 questions we got through on yesterday's mailbag. We'll see how we, I don't know if we can get through 44 today, but we'll get through as many as we possibly can today. So let's get right to it. The first question today comes from Altwine Scarborough, who writes, do you think that it is more important for reboots to stay faithful to the source material or find a new direction for the core story to go. Thank you so much. Now, I believe the answer to this question, you've you've heard me kind of talk about this before. It's the same rule I think applies to reboots, as applies to adapting novels, as applies to adapting comic books, as it applies to just about anything. The first, I've always believed this, I still believe this. The pri- The first priority of the filmmaker is, of course, to make the best movie possible. Now, the way you're fr- structuring your question, you're saying, okay, was that is that the best way then to do that by sticking to the source material or by finding a new direction? And the answer to that question, I believe, is either. Like, if the filmmaker's primary responsibility is to make the best movie possible, sometimes that might mean what would make the best movie possible is by sticking as close as possible to the source material, then you do that. If the answer to that question is, For this particular property, the best way to make the best movie possible is to go in a new creative direction, doing this way, taking some liberties, and you do that. It will all depend from property to property. It depends from movie to movie. It depends from book to book. It depends from comic to comic. Sometimes the comic or the novel or the original film is already pretty well suited for a modern retelling. Then you stick pretty close to the source material. Sometimes it's like, ah, that comic works great. There are certain elements of that comic that works great in the comic, but might not work as well in a live action modern movie. Then you take liberties. It's all up to the filmmaker. So I don't believe there is a general rule that either sticking to the source material or taking creative license is better. It all depends on the individual material. But thanks a lot for the question. Next question comes from Christopher Michael Woodburn, who writes, what film was your sleeper hit of 2016? Uh, Mine was 10 Cloverfield Lane. Well, thanks a lot for the question, Christopher. Um, You know, by sleeper hit, I kind of go by one I wasn't really paying attention to, wasn't even really on my radar coming out that year, but wow, it really blew me away. And that film to me was probably Don't Breathe. Don't Breathe was a film that I don't even know if I heard about it when 2016 began. And once I did hear about it, oh, another low budget kind of little horror movie. And seriously, how good was 2016 for horror movies? Between Conjuring 2, Lights Out, which I thought was another really pleasant surprise film for me. I loved Lights Out. Don't Breathe. I loved The Witch. I mean, there was just some good solid horror this year, but to me, the surprise hit of the year that caught me off guard the most was Don't Breathe. I I just couldn't believe how much I love that movie. All right. Next question comes from Michael Oppenheimer, who writes, what is your over under that the rumors of Deadpool showing up in Logan were caused because they already shot either a cameo or a post credit scene for Deadpool 2 on the set of Logan? Mine would be 35 to 40%. I would go way under. I don't think it happened at all. I wouldn't doubt if like, say, uh, Ryan Reynolds showed up on set to be there and just to see it happening and to meet with you, Jackman. I wouldn't doubt, but I highly, highly doubt that they shot a cameo or a post credit scene for Deadpool 2, a movie they haven't even got a script ready for yet. I highly doubt. So if you're asking me what my over under be on 30 to 45%, I'm going to go way under. Now, I still believe there is going to be a, a, a Logan cameo, a Wolverine cameo in Deadpool 2. I, I believe there will be. But that they shot it while they were shooting Logan? No, I don't think so at all. Uh, Marco Gonzalez writes, with Spider-Man joining the MCU, do you ever see the characters' movie rights being owned outright by Marvel Studios, or do you think Sony will hold on to them for the foreseeable future? Well, here's the thing. The way the Sony deal worked was, as long as they keep a new Spider-Man in production every X number of years, then they keep the rights. 
It's much like Daredevil. It, we put up a crash course on this last weekend that kind of explains us. And it's like Daredevil. The rights to Daredevil belong to Fox. But part of that deal was they had X amount of time to go into production on a new Daredevil movie. And if they weren't in production by the time that clock ran out, then the licensing rights would go back to Marvel. And that's what happened. Fox couldn't get into production on time, even though they had a Daredevil movie they wanted to make, and the rights went back to Marvel. The same kind of uh, thing applies and works with Spider-Man right now. Sony has the license. It's theirs. And as long as they keep making a new Spider-Man movie every X number of years, and I don't know what that X is. I don't know if that's five years or three years or whatever. But as long as they're within production of a brand new Spider-Man movie within X number of years, they get to keep the license. And then the license clock resets. And now they've got another X number of years. By making this deal with Marvel, one of the things that Marvel had to accept was that hey, if we make these movies with Sony, then that counts as that counts against the clock. So Marvel makes this new Spider-Man Homecoming movie with Sony, but that ensures that Sony keeps the license because now a brand new Spider-Man movie is coming out and it is a Sony movie. It's not a Marvel movie. It is a it is officially a Sony movie. So therefore they get to keep the rights. So as long as Sony and Marvel keep making Spider-Man movies, the rights are going to stay with Sony. Unless Marvel comes to Sony and says, hey, we'll cut you this check for $8 billion. Let us have it outright. But why would Marvel do that? If, if they make good movies with Sony for Spider-Man and Sony gets to be used in their cinematic universe and they're making money and Sony's making money and everybody's happy, I don't know why they would change it. We'll have to see how it all unfolds. And, you know, there might be other details to their deal as well that we don't know about. But on the surface, it looks like Sony's going to keep the rights for the foreseeable future. All right. The next com uh, question comes from Andrew Hodge, who writes, percentage chance if Wonder Woman and Justice League are bad, that DC cancels the rest of the movies. All right. So look, obviously, Batman versus Superman was much more divisive than they were hoping. Suicide Squad was not as universally loved as they were hoping. But both made money. Okay. They both made money. Neither of them cracked the bill. I don't think either of them cracked the billion dollar club, but both of them made money. So if let's say Wonder Woman and Justice League are both bad, the audience doesn't like them and they don't make money. If that happens, yes, I think they'll reset. I think they'll reboot the franchise. I think they'll take two or three years off and then relaunch the franchise because you can't go four movies in a row. You just can't do it. However, Let's say Wonder Woman and Justice League are bad, but they crack a billion dollars. If that's the case, then Warner Brothers has bought themselves some time and they can try making the next one or two movies and see if they can get the audience back on board. Um, so there's a lot of variables involved there. However, I still believe Wonder Woman will be good. My biggest question mark is Gal Gadot. It, it always has been. I, I still don't think she's a strong league actress. I do not think she can carry a movie. Um, but... You know what? I've got a lot of hope for the film. It is my number one most anticipated comic book movie of this upcoming year. I'm looking forward to it, and I think it'll be good. I think it'll be good. So I don't think we're going to have to worry about it. But yeah, theoretically speaking, and it is theoretical, if Wonder Woman sucked and made didn't make enough money, and then if Justice League sucks and it doesn't make enough money, and those are two big ifs, then yes, I do think Warner Brothers will cut bait and take two or three years off and then reboot it all again. That's what I think they'll probably do. All right. Andres Semenego writes, um, will watchers from outside the United States be able to watch the show on Verizon Go 90? Okay. What uh, Andres is talking about is the brand new show that we just launched on Friday called Awesome Tacular with Jeremy Johns. I love this show. I'm super excited about this show. I'm the executive producer on the show. Um, and it's the world of Jeremy Johns. And it's it's like everything from it's kind of like a 30-minute variety show. It's got some stuff of Jeremy Johns doing that thing. We all know Jeremy Johns doing his jump cut edit commentary. We've got a little bit of a panel in there as well. We've got comedy sketches. We've got a video game segment. Um, we've got like little in-between trivia stuff. It's actually a lot of fun and I love the show. Now, the show 
was commissioned by the network of Verizon Go90. That's an online network that's online and it's got mobile apps as well. So they, Verizon Go90 pays for it, for us to make that show for them. But right now, Verizon Go90 is only available to people in the United States. So when will that change? I don't know. That's a Verizon question. We're going to have to ask them. I think it'll eventually change, but that's just me. I'm not sure. But we will keep um, asking Verizon that. And as soon as we know more, we will let you guys know. Thank you so much for the question. All right. Damian Davies writes, do you think it's easier for a writer to direct his own movie, such as Quentin Tarantino, or if a director directs someone else's screenplay, can things get lost in translation, such uh, such was Joss Whedon on his Buffy screenplay or his Alien Resurrection script? Many thanks. Um, there are pros and cons to both. The, the pros for a director coming in with a pre-existing script that they themselves did not write... I mean, number one, you know the studio likes a script because they're giving it to a director to direct. And now the director can kind of put their take on the script. Because when when a studio is hiring a director to direct a film that they already have a script for, they're looking for the director to take that script and kind of give their take on it and see what they're going to do with it. And sometimes that can be easier. Sometimes, like in the event of the upcoming Batman movie where Ben Affleck is both the director and the writer, uh, there were Quentin Tarantino both writes and directs his own film. Sometimes that's easier. So it really depends on the filmmaker um, because if you're just a filmmaker, you can just worry about directing. Then you can just worry about, you don't have to worry about the script stuff. If something comes up and you want to change in the script, you can either contact the writers and say, change this, or you can do it yourself, whatever. So sometimes it's easier that way. For people like Quentin Tarantino, it's easier for him to follow his vision through from script to screen if he is writing it and directing it. It really all depends on the director, but it's a great question. All right. Jacob Kidd writes, what is the elusive orange drink that you're always sipping on? Well, you know what? I'll Right now, as you can see, just, it just so happens I just got plain water right now, which I should be taking a sip of right now anyway because my throat's getting dry. But quite often you see that it's orange. I've, I've explained this a couple times, so I'll do it again. Um... Let's see here. Uh, Currently, I like uh, these uh, Mio uh, vitamin shots. It's uh, it's a vitamin shot that puts vitamins in the water and it's flavored. This is orange tangerine. So I simply take the water. I take the vitamin shot. Just squeeze a little tiny bit in there. And then uh, put the cap on the old bottle. Shake it up. And there, now I've got my orange drink that's got a, a few more vitamins and just tastes a little better. So it's really, it, it's just water with a vitamin shot in it. That's all. Mm. But it does taste pretty good. I'll say that. Okay, thanks a lot, Jacob. Next question comes from John Luis Rodriguez, who writes, do you think there's anybody that can be the Kevin Feige of DC? Well, one of the big advantages and, and the things that I think Marvel really has going for it and why Marvel has let's 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 call a spade a spade. As far as the cinematic universes go, Marvel has had more success than DC. I think that's fair to say. Whether you're a Marvel fan, whether you're a DC fan, I think it's fair to say that Marvel has had more success at, at, up to this point than DC has had success, both with critical response and with the audience and box office. Okay, I personally think that the main reason is their organizational structure. And their leadership structure. And really where everything falls under the one umbrella of Kevin Feige. Now, Kevin Feige has people he has to answer to as well. He has bosses as well. But, you know, it comes down to Kevin Feige. And he's the guy who sets the creative direction for the entire cinematic universe. DC right now does not have that. They pretend like they have it, but they really don't. They have too many cooks in the kitchen and things just get kind of messy. And they go go all over the place. Can somebody be that Kevin Feige figure for DC? Yes, but it'll take a couple things. Number one, it'll take Warner Brothers to reorganize and trust one person to be the shepherd for that universe. Yes, that one person still has to be answerable to his bosses or her bosses, but there it's at least they have to create that position where one person is going to be the overall guiding shepherd of that universe. And they get to bring on the directors they want to work with. And then they work directly with those directors and those writers to make sure that the overall universe is working and everything fits together. They can do that. They just have to make the choice to do it. 
And if they make that choice to do it, yeah, somebody can do it. Look, I've said for a long time, I think Ben Affleck can be that guy. I think Ben Affleck can be that guy. He's one of the most talented filmmakers in the industry today. Uh, he has a, everybody knows about his deep passion and love for DC Comics. So he knows the source material. He's a well-established, one of the most celebrated filmmakers in the business today. You could, Absolutely, he can be that guy. But there are other people that can be that guy too that we've never heard of. As long as they have great vision, they've got a pedigree in the film industry, they know how to make films, don't make it a comic book guy. Make it a film guy or girl who knows the comics very, 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 very well. Like, I'm sorry, uh, Jeff Johns is not a movie guy. He's not. He's lending a hand to the Wonder Woman script. We'll see how that turns out. Hopefully, it'll turn out really great. But he is a comic god. He's a god amongst comic writers, and that's great. But I think you need somebody who is first and foremost a film person who knows film, because this is film, who then also secondarily happens to know a lot about the comics and has a lot of passion for the comics as well. That's who I think it needs to be. Ben Affleck fits that role perfectly, but there would be others as well. I think they can do it, and I think they should do it. All right. Um, Victor Joseph Garrity writes, what current or recently retired NFL player would you most like to see a film about? I would love to see a film about um, uh, Tom Brady, uh, Patriots quarterback, best in the game today, in my opinion. And he was the very last guy selected in this draft. Nobody else wanted him. And he was the last guy picked. And now he's like breaking every record the NFL has ever had. So I would love to see a thing about uh, Tom Brady. All right. Christopher Michael Woodburn writes, how excited would you be if Christopher Nolan directed a Star Wars film? Interesting question. And I don't think the answer I'm going to give you is the one you're expecting. If you've heard me review Christopher Nolan's films, you know I love Christopher Nolan. I think the guy is amazing. I love his movies. I think his worst movie was Interstellar, and that was really good. So that that's his worst movie. Um, whether you're talking about Memento and Insomnia, obviously the Batman films, Prestige, whatever. I think Christopher Nolan is a dynamic, wonderful, deep filmmaker, and I get giddy and count down. I can't wait to see Dunkirk. I get excited whenever he has a new movie coming out. That being said, I don't want him directing a Star Wars movie. It's 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 a matter of fit. It's a matter of fit. I don't think Christopher Nolan's style, which he is so good at, I don't think that style fits in the Star Wars universe. I, I just don't think it's a good fit. He's definitely talented enough. I just don't think it's the right fit. Now, then you could raise the argument and say, well, what if he did an anthology film that's meant to be its own thing? Okay, there are some interesting, there are some interesting ideas you could have there. But that would that's a qualifier, right? So if you're asking me how excited would I be if I heard Christopher Nolan's doing a Star Wars movie, I would honestly be a little cautious because I just don't know that the style is a good fit for Star Wars. But who knows? Like I always say, it's never a mistake to, to draft good talent. And Christopher Nolan is pretty much as talented as it gets. All right. Next question comes from Matthias Thompson, who writes, what would you think of Liam Neeson returning to play Qui-Gon's Force Ghost in episode eight or nine? Honestly, I don't want it because it doesn't make any sense. Um, Like when Obi-Wan appears to Luke, that makes sense. Obi-Wan and Luke had a connection. They knew each other. They knew each other in life and in death. When, um, you know, Qui-Gon in Rebels starts to reach out through the Force to Yoda, that makes sense. He was a Padawan of Yoda. He he Yoda was his master. He was the head of the Jedi. They have a connection. They know each other. That makes sense. Qui Gon is neither related to, nor had any direct connection with anybody in the current Star Wars universe. Ray never met him. Finn never met him. Poe never met him. As far as we know, there's no bloodline connection between Ray and Qui Gon. So why would Qui Gon appear to her instead of a thousand other Jedi's? Or, um, I mean, it, it just, so while I love Liam Neeson, he's one of my favorite guys in Hollywood. And while I love the character of Qui-Gon Jinn, I don't think it would make any sense for Qui-Gon to appear as a force ghost in episode eight or nine, because there's simply no connection there. So, um, so I wouldn't want it. I wouldn't want it, despite how much I like Liam Neeson and how much I like the character. All right. Next question comes from Drewski Marker, who writes, 
How often do you look for on-screen talent for movie talk? Ah, okay. So that's a good question. Um, Because we've been doing a lot of hiring lately around uh, Collider Video, but mostly it's been for producers, writers, editors, um, uh, finance people, stuff like that. The question uh, is being asked, how often do I I look for on-screen talent? Very rarely. Very, very rarely. Because we've got such a great group of talent. Um, And I mean, the last on-camera talent we hired... Well, I guess the last on-camera talent we hired was Pamela Horton. We hired her to be on Awesome Tacular, to be the video game person with Jeremy Johns on Awesome Tacular. And we did do a talent search for that. We put out uh, a casting call and we interviewed and auditioned a bunch of people. And we ended up with uh, Gamer Next Door's Pamela Horton because she's awesome. And we were really lucky that we got her. Um, But then like with Jeremy Johns, we specifically reached out to Jeremy Johns to hire him because... I mean, he's the best, my opinion, I've said this before, I'll say it again, my opinion, he's the best online YouTube film critic there is. Um, he has a massive, massive following and he just fit really well with us. And so we directly reached out to try to bring in Jeremy Johns. I think the last time though, we tried to uh, hire for online talent, as far as like pundits go, like a commentator was three or four years ago when we ended up hiring Christian uh, Christian Harloff. We put out a big casting call. We hired a couple of people and Christian Harloff was one of them. But it's been three or four years because we've had John Schnepp forever. We've had me forever. We got Dennis forever. We got uh, Mark and Christian here. We got Jeremy Johns. We've got Perry Nemiroff. We've got, um, you know, for a horror thing, we're set for horror because we've already got uh, uh, Clark Wolf. We, when it comes to Jedi Council, we got all of our people, whether it's Tiffany Smith or, you know, uh, Ken Knapsack, whatever. Um, you know, we just got a lot of people. And so we have great on camera talent here now. So we don't hire very often. We don't reach out or search for on camera talent very often because we've, we've got an overabundance of great on camera talent. In my opinion, we've got an overabundance of on camera talent. Um, and, but when we do, when we do look for somebody, I put it out on my social media. I put out a casting call, um, and you know, if you if you're if you want to know when we're hiring, the best thing to do is follow me on social media because that's the first part, place I put it when we're looking to hire around here. Is I put it on my social media, and I say I'm looking to hire somebody for this, 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 or this, and that's the best way to find out. But it's more often than not, and the the more most of the hiring that we're going to be doing over the next little while is going to be behind the scenes stuff. But as we expand and as we add more shows, and we are going to be adding more shows, we're going to be looking for more on-camera talent. Watch my social media for when we uh, make those calls. All right. Uh, Grayson Rodriguez writes, um, will Darth Maul be the villain of an Obi-Wan film? I doubt it because, you know, we just saw recently the Rebels Season 3 mid-season trailer was just released. And we see that Obi-Wan and Darth Maul are going to confront each other again. And I think it's a 95% chance that Darth Maul dies. In that when when Obi-Wan and Darth Maul confront each other again, I think Darth Maul dies. And so with them setting that up in the cartoon show, I think it's highly unlikely that we're going to see Maul and Obi-Wan square off in an Obi-Wan film. We don't even know if there's going to be an Obi-Wan film at this point. So let's keep that in mind too. All right, next question comes from Dylan Bishop. And Dylan Bishop writes, what do you think the best comic book movie will be by the end of 2017? My opinion is that Logan is going to be the best one. I think Logan has a very good shot at it. Um, but I I think the best one is probably going to be Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Um, James Gunn just did such a great job out of nowhere with the original um, it's, it's not my most anticipated. I've said this before. My most anticipated one is Wonder Woman. I'm, I'm most looking forward to Wonder Woman, but I think Guardians of the Galaxy 2 will probably end up being better. I think it's going to be better than Thor Ragnarok. I think it's going to be better than uh, Wonder Woman. I think it's going to be better than Logan. I think that. Now, will it actually be that way? I don't know. We have to wait to watch the movies, but that's what I'm guessing right now. All right. Uh, Chris Snyder writes, how do you feel about Game of Thrones? I like Game of Thrones. I Look, I, I fully admit, I am not a hardcore Game of Thrones fan, but I do enjoy it. And I got to tell you, the last two episodes of the last season was some of the best television ever. Um, I went out on a limb and I said the season finale 
of Game of Thrones this year was probably the best season finale ever in television history. I can't think of a season finale that was ever as good as the season finale of Game of Thrones this past year. Um, it was just insanely good. And I'm very much looking forward to what comes next. So what do I feel? How do I feel about Game of Thrones? I am a fan. I'm a fan, but I'm not like a hardcore, hardcore fan like a lot of <laughs> friends of mine are. Uh, Kyle Summerall writes, <coughs> pardon me, watched Hugo for the first time last night, and it reminded me of how lucky we are to be able to go to the movies and enjoy them. What is a movie that you have seen that reminds you of why you love going to the movies? Well, there's two films in recent history that really fit that bill for me. <coughs> um, first was a movie that came out a couple of years ago called The Help. Um, an incredible powerhouse cast, uh, Emma Stone, Octavia Spencer, and, and many others. It's a wonderful film. It's the type of movie that just reminds me about why I love the movies. So The Help was one of them. And more recently, this year in 2016, um, was Queen of Cotway. Queen of Cotway, I just felt so good. I don't know that I've, I can't remember the last time I came out of a movie theater feeling as good as I felt coming out of Queen of Cotway. And you've heard me mention say this before about Queen of Cotway. It's just a movie about really good people doing really good things. And that's what Queen of Cotway is. And it just, it lifts the spirit. It's the type of movie that just lifts the spirit. You know what I mean? And it's, so yeah, The Help and Queen of Cotway are two, you know, in recent history films that really just remind me about why I love the movie so much. Thanks a lot for the question. It's a great question. Uh, ben Rayner writes, Hey, uh, John, I love it when you do mailbags like the old days. Oh, well, yeah, thank you. This is kind of like the old days too, isn't it? Um, Joshua Rayner writes, who is this his second question? I can't remember. Anyway, Joshua Rayner writes, any word on the Starship Troopers reboot? I love the first film and was so disappointed in the second that I never watched the third. Do you think that today's Hollywood can do it justice? <laughs> or should they just leave it be and thanks and bring on the filthy? I, I'm Look, Starship Troopers is as much a guilty pleasure of mine as it is anybody's, okay? But, but let's not pretend that Starship Troopers is some beacon of Hollywood cinema excellence that can Hollywood do it justice? Uh, yeah, it's it's a silly, ridiculous, that first one. And I, I eat it up. I love the first Starship Troopers, but let's let's call what it is. I mean, it's, it's a ridiculous, slap-happy, nonsensical movie. This is a lot of fun to watch. Uh, and I love it. I, I kind of compare it to um, the original Mortal Kombat in, in that way. Can Hollywood do it justice? Yes, Hollywood can do it justice. Um, but, you know, when you talk about the second or third movie, they slashed the budgets on them. They didn't really put a lot of care into them uh, much at all. Um, if they want to do a full-blown, big-budget, actual feature-length, you know, reestablishing of Starship Troopers, they can do it. I haven't heard much about the reboot, so I don't know where it stands. And I don't even know if it will ever actually happen at least on a big scale, uh, like what we're talking about here. But it's possible. Let's keep our eyes open. But can they do it justice? Yeah, they, they can do the original Starship Troopers justice. Uh, Raphael Hespenhot, Hespenhol. I know I'm butchering your name, dude. Forgive me. Hey, John. I uh, would really like to know if you watched Westworld. And if you did, did you like it? Ah, I did watch Westworld. I was a little late to the party, but I binged it. I don't think it's all that great. Sorry, I, there are a couple of great episodes. There certainly were a couple of great episodes. But overall, the premise itself doesn't really resonate. It, it doesn't seem like all that compelling of a, of a premise to start with. And I found it very plotting. Like, I just found it very slow. And it's okay for shows to have a slow pace, but it felt like drudging. Like a lot of the series, at least season one, felt like it was just drudging along with the exception, like I said, of a couple of very key, very good episodes. Um, it's interesting. I don't think it's a bad show. I mean, it's interesting enough that I I watched it all the way through to, to its season finale. And I will probably give season two a shot. But um, for me, 
with all the buzz that I heard about it, I mean, I was expecting to be blown away. Like, this will be the next Game of Thrones. This will be the next Breaking Bad. This will be the next Battlestar Galactica. Um, and for me, it wasn't any of those. It, it falls way, sh- like, well short of that. But I, a lot of really good, smart television people really love that show. And I know there's a lot of you guys who love the show as well, and that's awesome. It just didn't click for me the way it clicked it, it clicked for a lot of people. But who knows? Maybe season two will uh, change that around for me. All right, next question comes from Brennan Krauss, who writes, Any chance Jake Gyllenhaal or any other cast member gets nominated for Nocturnal Animals? The movie had some of the strongest performances of the year. I disagree, except for Michael Shannon. Michael Shannon was pretty outrageously good in that. Um, The rest of the performances I thought were okay. I thought they were good. Overall, I thought Nocturnal Animals was just a slightly better than okay movie. I didn't think it was all that great. But uh, again, a lot of people just love that film. And that's the beautiful thing about film, man. It's all subjective. Some people watch it, totally loved it. And that's great. I watched it, didn't get as much out of it. But Michael Shannon's performance is pretty damn good. I would not be surprised if Michael Shannon gets a Best Supporting Actor nomination uh, for his role in that film this year. I don't think Jake Gyllenhaal will. And I honestly, I don't think Jake Gyllenhaal deserves it for that. Gyllenhaal's a great actor. But I thought Jake Gyllenhaal was a lot better in uh, Night... Oh, what what was his name? Nightcrawler? Was that it? Nightcrawler? Yeah, I thought I thought John Hall was better than Nightcrawler. I thought if he ever deserved an Academy nomination, it was for Nightcrawler. So obviously he's very, very good, but I, I wouldn't give him a nomination for his role in Nocturnal Animals. Um, James Lewis writes, <clears throat> how does a company like Marvel own the rights to Thor, a Norse god? How does that work? Thanks, John. Well, here's the, okay, great question. Because Thor was and and the stories of Thor were around a long time before Disney. Nobody owns Thor. Nobody owns Thor. Here's what happens. Thor himself, he is what's called public domain. Anybody can write a story about Thor. You can write a story about Thor right now. What you cannot do is do anything with Thor that is original to what Marvel did with Thor. Okay? So, let's say... Um, I, I'm not really sure what specifically to say, but let's there are things in Thor that aren't part of the traditional Thor mythology that Disney just made up and they used in Thor. Well, those elements now belong to Disney. Here's another great example. Um... There are some, take uh, Wizard of Oz, right? There are some things in Wizard of Oz, the book, and then there's the original Wizard of Oz movie that created some things of their own. For example, I believe the ruby red slippers in Wizard of Oz were created in the movie. They, I don't think the ruby slippers were in the original book. I, I could be wrong about that, but I, I'm and correct me if I'm wrong in, in the comment section, but I'm pretty sure the ruby slippers weren't in the book Wizard of Oz. The, I think it was MGM who did the movie. Um, they created the ruby slippers to use in the movie, right? So if today, if I wanted to do a Wizard of Oz movie based on the book, which I now believe is public domain, I could do that, but I can only use things that are in the original book or that I create myself. I can't use any of the elements of Wizard of Oz that were in that original MGM movie, like the Ruby Slippers, because MGM created that. So do you see what I'm talking about here? So anybody can make a movie about Thor, the god, the, the Norse god of mythology, Thor. Anybody can do it. But they have to be careful then to only use elements that are in the original source material, the original legends of Thor, or that you yourself create to put on top of those original uh, mythology stories. But you cannot start using stuff that was created in the Disney movies or in anybody else's movie that used Thor. Anything that was original to them, that belongs to them. So how can Disney own Thor? They don't own Thor. They own their version of Thor but they don't own Thor. Anybody can make a movie about the Norse god Thor. They just can't use things that Disney has created specifically for their incarnation of Thor. I hope that clears it up a little bit. Let me know if, if uh, I wasn't clear. Uh, leave some, leave a comment in the in the uh, comment section below. All right. Next question comes from Andres Ortiz who writes, guiltiest coming of age movie. Huh, Porky's. 
Porky's probably my guiltiest coming of age movies. I love Porky's. Uh, Nick Reeve writes, do you think Alden Ehrenreich will play Han Solo in multiple films? Honestly, no. I mean, look, the Han Solo movie comes out, Han Solo being played by Alden Ehrenreich, and let's say it's awesome, and the audience loves it, and it makes $1.5 billion worldwide. Okay, well, guess what? Disney's going to look at making another one, okay? But honestly... I think the plan is just to make one. I could be wrong about that. I don't believe there's anything out there officially stating anything, but I think there's just going to be one. I think he will be Han Solo once, and I think that's it. That all goes out the window if the movie makes $1.5 billion and the audience loves it, but for now, I think we're only going to see him play it once. We'll have to wait and see. Patrick McCabe writes, after watching La La Land, what's your favorite musical? Not a huge musical fan, but love singing in the rain and guys and dolls growing up. La La Land was awesome, by the way. Yeah, La La Land is spectacular. I love La La Land. I believe it was my number five favorite film of the year. Um, it's, it's wonderful, but honestly, if I had, it's not one of the old classics. If I had to be pushed on what is my favorite musical movie, it's actually probably and, and not with counting Disney movies, but Disney movies aren't really musicals. They're movies that has songs in them, but the majority of the movies not taken up with song. If I had to say my favorite musical, it's probably Moulin Rouge. I love Moulin Rouge. It's it's just amazing with Ewan McGregor and Nicole Kidman. If you haven't seen Moulin Rouge, check it out. It Visually, it's just one of the most spectacular visual movies I've ever seen, too. It's absolutely breathtaking. Make sure you check that out if you haven't seen it yet. All right. Um, Eric Overturf writes... Do you think that we will ever get a good video game movie? I'm waiting for the Gears of War movie. Uh, have you guys heard anything about that one yet, or is it dead in the water, so to speak? I, I think Gears of War is still in development. Will we ever get a really good video game movie? The odds of averages says yes. It has to happen eventually. I think Last of Us is the next big hope that we have, and Uncharted. I think those two are the next two big ones. Remember, we, for years, we've pinned our hopes on Warcraft and um, Assassin's Creed. I liked Warcraft, but it wasn't great. I thought Assassin's Creed was a total bag of shit. That movie sucks. Um, so that's not it. So now we've got, I think the next two we can look forward to are Uncharted and probably Last of Us. And I think, fingers crossed, I think one of those will break will break the curse. Then again, I thought that about Warcraft and Assassin's Creed, but now we can pin our hopes on Uncharted and Last of Us. I think those two have a chance. All right. Uh, Made U Raman writes... Could Denzel Washington potentially be nominated for both acting and directing this year, or will they focus more on his acting? No, no, no. Remember, the way the Oscars work, we did a, a crash course on this on how Oscar nominations work. Actors set who the nominees for best acting are. And directors, members of the director's wing of the Academy, settle on who the nominees for best director will be. Now, once the nominees are set, then the whole Academy votes on who should win. But, you know, the actors don't care about the be best director nominees. The actors don't care about the best director nominees. They only care about setting up the best acting nominees. So I do believe Denzel Washington has a shot at being nominated for best director or for best actor, because I believe the actors may think well enough of his performance that they will put him up to be nominated. And I think there's a chance, an outside chance, but a chance that Denzel, that the director's branch of the Academy will think enough of Denzel's performance as a director this year for offenses to nominate him for that. Now, after that's done and out of the way and all the nominees are set, then the whole Academy votes. So you don't have to worry about, oh, are they going to focus more on him as an actor? Are they going to focus more on him as a director? Well, it's two different branches that are worrying about the acting branch and the directing branch. You don't need to worry about that. So yes, there is a, a decent chance, not an overwhelmingly good chance, but a decent chance that Denzel Washington uh, will end up getting nominated both as an actor and as a director this year. We'll have to wait and see. Chris Diaz writes, are you going to do a commentary on the Suicide Squad? I doubt it. I doubt it. it it's, it's possible. If you guys really want a Suicide Squad commentary, let us know. But I don't think there's an overwhelming desire out there for people to see us do a Suicide Squad commentary, but maybe I'm wrong. Let us know. Um, Ryan Keffy writes, when do you think we are going to get a title for episode eight? At this point, maybe Star Wars Celebration in April. It, it's starting to look, or in February. I think if it doesn't happen in February, it'll definitely happen at Star Wars Celebration in April. Matthew Butler writes, 
What is your mother's favorite Star Wars movie? The original, Star Wars Episode Four: New Hope. That's my mom's favorite. And my mom is the one who got me into Star Wars. Uh, Andrew Hanna writes, Hi, John. My question is about the relationship between directors and cinematographers. How much of the camera shots are left to the cinematographer? And when and where does the director come into play? Thanks. It all depends on the relationship between that director and that cinematographer. So yet, some cinematographers like Deacons, right? Where I'm sure a lot of the, act- the directors will go, dude, you know, you know what I want. The director will say to Deacon, you know what I want. Now, you figure out the best way to shoot that. Go ahead and go. And the director will then focus on the story and director on getting the performances out of the actors and, and the bigger picture stuff. Uh, sometimes they'll be more hands-on and they'll tell, like I think Quentin Tarantino, even though he works with some great cinematographies, Quentin Tarantino is very active involved in the cinematography process as well. So it all depends on the individual director and the individual cinematographer and the unique relationship that those two have. Uh, I know personally, when I shot my little movie, I had a really great cinematographer and I just said, okay, this is what this scene is going to do. This is what I want to accomplish in the scene. This is what I want the feel of the scene to be. Now you decide the camera angles and the shots and the best way to compose those shots. You're the cinematographer. I trust you. You go ahead and make those calls. But I'm sure it's it's different from director to director. Uh, Okay. Matthew Denton writes, at one point, I know you mentioned uh, doing a pay service for the Collider podcast since you don't make any money off them like on YouTube. What benefit does having pod- podcasts give you then? I pretty much exclusively listen to your stuff on my phone at work. Would like to know if I'm helping out at all or for all the great content you guys provide. Yeah. What do putting up podcasts do for us? Nothing. Actually, they hurt us. Um, but we had enough of you guys tell us you really want the audio podcasts that we put them up. But honestly, they do nothing but hurt us because we don't make anything. Um, it doesn't matter if 5 billion people listen to it. We don't make a dime off of the podcasts. Um, and a lot of you guys listen to the podcast. And it actually takes away because I know some people, you know, if they have a choice between the podcast and the YouTube video, they'll listen to the podcast. And so by putting up the podcast, we're take, we're losing views on YouTube because people are, some people prefer to listen to the podcast and therefore they don't watch the YouTube videos. So that actually hurts us. Um, but we just do it for the fans. I mean, at some point I'm thinking we might create a like $3 a month service where you can get all the podcasts and and we'll do extra special podcasts and all that kind of stuff. We'll make it worth your while. At some point we might do that. We looked at doing that last year and we didn't, we decided not to at the time. Um, but yeah, I don't know. The, the podcasts do nothing for us. They only hurt us. We just do it because there's a lot of our fans who like to have it. And so that's the way we're doing it for now. Um, Pierre Davis senior writes, why do you consider return of the Jedi, the best star Wars film? Cause it's the best. <laughs> it's the best. The, one of the greatest scenes in cinematic history, Luke versus Vader in, in the throne room, the greatest space battle in cinematic history with that battle around the death star, the, all the entire Jabba sequence stuff. Um, I just, I just, it's my favorite of the Star Wars films. Uh, Pablo uh, Luz Poin writes, because of that huge revelation in the latest mid-season trailer of Rebels, how big are the chances that we're going to have an Obi-Wan spinoff? Or will we simply see Ewan return as a Force ghost in episode eight and nine? No, I, I mentioned this on Jedi Council the other day. Because of that mid-season trailer for Rebels, which it's not a spoiler because it's a trailer, that shows that Darth Maul and Obi-Wan Kenobi will confront each other again on Tatooine. I think Lucasfilm is slowly leading us to an Obi-Wan movie. That's why I believe at Star Wars Celebration April, I believe they're going to announce an Obi-Wan standalone film because I feel that's like what they're building up to. I actually think there's a better chance of an Obi-Wan movie being announced in a Boba Fett movie. Now, that's just my personal feelings. I'm not basing that on any behind-the-scenes knowledge. I'm just speculating. I'm just guessing. But I think there's a very good chance, especially because of that Rebels uh, mid-season trailer, that we are going to get a standalone Obi-Wan film. Okay, I'm just going to race through a couple more here, and then I'm going to wrap up. Juan Carlos Sombrero writes, um, So how... Has your responsibilities and work schedule changed since you came back just hosting Movie Talk instead of running the whole Collider channel? Um, Okay, so I mentioned this on my Facebook page the other day. Um, My responsibilities around here have changed. When I originally came back, um, when I originally came back to Collider, it was only to host Movie Talk and and to run Movie Talk. That was the arrangement. However, once... Collider Video through Complex decided 
what our bigger picture was going to be, it was clear we needed a reorganization of leadership. So my new role here at um, at Collider Video is I am the head of programming, uh, which says it right there. I am the head of programming, the executive producer of all the shows that we do. Um, uh, Dennis is the uh, head of production. And I can't yet announce, you can guess, uh, you, I can't yet announce who our head of development is. Um, so basically, here's what happens. Um, so my responsibility is all the shows, creatively. What shows we do, who's on those shows, what we do. And I work directly with all the individual showrunners. Christian as the showrunner of Jedi Council. I work directly with Schnepp as the showrunner of Heroes. Um, Clark as, a, as the showrunner of Nightmares, so on and so forth. So all, I work with all the showrunners. And... You know, I decide what new shows we want to do, all that kind of stuff. I mean, when I say I decide, I'll do that in consultation with all the other leadership as well. And then um, the director, the head of development's job is when I want something done, it's the head of development's job then to take that thing I want done and then work with their team. We have a whole team of writers here now, writers and producers, and the head of development will then work with his team of writers and producers to bring that thing that I want to life. Then once that's ready to go and I approve it, then we go to Dennis, who's the head of production, who has an entire staff of production people that work with him, that it, now he is kind of in charge of how we're going to execute that. Like, how are we going to shoot it? What do we need to do this? You know, what's the cost involved? What are we going to do? Blah, 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 blah. So there is like a head of programming. Uh, that's me. Head of um, uh, production, which is Dennis. Head of development, which is another person. So that's kind of the way things work around here now. And that's, that's my role here now. Um, so yeah, but thank you for the questions. A little bit of behind the scenes stuff. Uh, Matt uh, Terrell writes, do you base reviews on first watches or do you like a second watch uh, before reviewing it? No, because we have to get reviews up so quick. We only have time to see a movie once. So I base most of my reviews on the first time viewing. And 90% of the time, my reviews would stay exactly the same, much like you, I'm sure. When you watch a movie, 90% of the time, the second time you watch the movie, it's the exact same experience. But 10% of the time, like 10% of the time, your second viewing might be a different experience. Like for me, like the, the Phantom Menace, you know, I thought I loved the Phantom Menace for someone to watch it, but then the more I watch it, I realized, no, this movie really sucks. Or the opposite. Um, in Glorious Bastards, the first time I watched Inglorious Bastards, I hated the movie. I don't know what the hell was wrong with me. And then the second time I watched it, I was like, wait a minute, this movie's awesome. Why didn't I like it the first time? So like that happens once in a while. I'm sure that happens to you too. So no, I base all my reviews on my first experience because my first experience 90% of the time, much like you, is probably always the way it's going to be. And then there's like that 10% of the time that we have a different experience the second time. Um, let's see. Alan Gonzalez writes, what happens if the Wonder Woman fails? I don't think it will. If it does, they still have Justice League. If both of them fail, then they might have to reboot some stuff. Um, uh, Mujtaba Ahmed writes, if Han Solo movie, if the Han Solo movie moves to December and Avatar 2 stays at its December 2018 release date, who wins the box office? We talked about that question came up actually on Jedi Council earlier this week. I believe Han Solo beats Avatar 2. It's just been too long since the first Avatar. I think Avatar will do a lot of damage. Um, I don't think either Avatar or the Han Solo movie really want to go up against each other. But if they do, Han Solo will be the winner. Uh, Miles Pador writes, Do you think the Maul Obi-Wan story in Rebels could have been better served in a potential Obi-Wan standalone? Well, it's hard to say because I haven't seen what they're doing with it in Rebels yet. But, you know, just with a blank sheet of paper... Do I think an Obi-Wan Maul story will be better in Rebels or in a standalone movie? I would say standalone movie, but we're going to have to see how well they do it in uh, Rebels because maybe they'll blow our socks off with this, with it. Um, okay, guy, I guess that's it. I, I've, I've run out of time here. I got to shut this thing down. Thanks so much for joining me, not just today, but this weekend here on Mailbag. And, and thank you for your support. And thank you for sending in all the questions we got. I hope I got through a whole shit ass ton of them. Thank you for sending them in. We're going to do this again next weekend. Keep your eyes open for when we call in for questions. Make sure, guys, you subscribe to our YouTube channel here on Collider Video. Make sure you subscribe and click that notification button as well, that little bell, to make sure you're getting notified of when new content comes out. And don't forget, if you live in the United States of America, check out the new Verizon Go90 network where our brand new show, Awesome Tacular with Jeremy Johns is now airing. The first three episodes are now up. Go and check that out. So thanks again for joining me, guys. Thanks a lot. My name is John Campia. You can follow me on Facebook and on Twitter simply at John Campia, and I'll see you next time.